Grand Rapids, Michigan is once again our site tonight for Night Light. Mm -hmm. And we're following up on the ASI meeting of this evening, and that was a very inspirational meeting. Absolutely. Always great music and great preaching, That's great right. testimony. Great, great and, stories. Uh, yeah. Camp it, meeting time. It right really there. is. And and there is no greater group to be with Absolutely. than these people. They're most inspiring Ab group I've ever been around. Absolutely. Well, GYC as well, but <laughs> those are our young people. But these are the most inspiring adults I've ever been around. That's Absolutely. for sure. But listen, tonight we are going to have a very important discussion. We have joining us on the platform mm -hmm. Doug Batchelor, yeah. Stephen Bohr, and Pastor Jay Gallimore. Mm -hmm. uh, the discussion is going to be ordination. <clears throat> What does the Bible teach about ordination? Now, oh, wow. this is a very big sure subject. you sure you want to talk about this tonight <laughs> live on live television, well, Jim? Well, you know something? We want to talk about what does the Bible teach? What is the position of our Seventh-day Adventist okay. Church? Do we follow what the Bible teaches? And why do we follow what the Bible teaches if we do? So that's going to be our discussion. It's going to be interesting. Absolutely. I want you to get a notebook. Right. I want you to get ready to take notes. We're going to have a number you can call in a little bit if you want to participate uh, in a poll that's being taken. Taking a survey tonight. A survey, right. that's correct. And also we'll give you the results of another survey that was taken this past week. So this yeah. is going to be a very interesting uh, evening. The thing, the only thing missing tonight is C.A. Murray. C.A. Murray, and uh, we say hello to C.A. Yes. Uh, he's still in St. Louis in the hospital. But he's watching. Bypass with uh, six bypasses, eight hours surgery. Uh, he's had a rough go, but God is blessed. He's yes. getting stronger every day. He's out of ICU, and uh, we're happy for that. And he's even talking about going home in a day or so. He really is. And I uh, hope he doesn't go home too soon. No. That's my advice to you, pal. <laughs> Stay there one yeah. day beyond when they say you can go home. That's right. That's right. Uh, Jim Gilly, nine days after he had his, I went to visit him in Florida, and for some reason we decided to go out and eat. And I, I'm sorry that I got you out a little premature because I think you suffered after I left. No, not but, really. Uh, I, it was great. It was so good to see Danny. He'd come all the way from southern Illinois down to Florida uh, where I was having the surgery. And, uh -huh. boy, I, he was oh. a sight for sore eyes, I guarantee you. It's wow. amazing. You know, when you're not feeling well, you're always glad when you see people come, and you're always glad when you see them go. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, was, I, was, yeah. I was glad you came, and, yeah, I, yeah. and I was still yeah. glad. No, no, no. I wasn't glad when you yeah. left. I'm yeah. teasing you there. Ab absolutely. But, but we're, we're praying for you, CA yes. and Irma. And all of you, God is, and we want all of our viewers around the world continue to pray. And we're missing you here at ASI. This is the first time in a long time CA's not been here because what a lot of folk don't know is Jim, uh, usually CA's kind of ramrodding this whole thing. He's well, yeah. setting up the programs, he's doing the night lights. That's and right. he's kind of, we're just kind of following his lead. We sure are. And so in now fact, we're having to try to do it without this, him. He did a lot of work on this yeah. program before he yeah. went to the hospital. Yeah, he did. He did, uh, got the survey ready and all that. So, see, we appreciate all the work you did. And, folks, this whole idea of this program is not to divide, but no. to unite. Absolutely. You see, mission unites. And sometimes uh, getting uh, into divisive subjects uh, concerning even theological questions can divide. Mm -hmm. We want to unite, but we want to unite around truth, around biblical truth. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight is unity, not by just uh, ignoring things and coming together, right. Right. but unity by understanding what God teaches. Mm -hmm. This is a country that's divided. This is a country that is terribly divided. I've never seen it any worse in the number of years that I've been alive. Right. But I will say, and I will say this, that if we aren't careful, we could see our church divided. Oh, wow. We don't want to see that. Mm -hmm. We want to see unification, pulling together, Absolutely. being one. You know, Danny, the Lord gave you a song sometime back, uh, and it was entitled, America, We Are One. Yes. You know, today in our families, we don't want to be divided. In our country, we don't want to be divided. In our 
homes and our churches, we want to not be divided. Absolutely. We want to be as one. And so, Danny, I've asked them if they will play that song tonight. Okay. And uh, Yvonne sings. Yeah. Uh, you uh, do the uh, readings there from uh, uh, the great readings of, of our country. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to listen right now. We have our uh, three ABN singers, and we yes. have some visiting singers from Nashville, Tennessee. That's right. Some people that sang with Elvis Presley back in the day. Yeah. The lady who was, uh, has number one country hits. They're all Christians. Yes. And uh, so now we have... Um, Reggie and Lady Love Smith and a number of other folk who are joining us. And uh, so this has been interesting. And we, if you would like a copy of this song, the DVD, the CDs, uh, you can always call us or write us there at 3ABN. We'd be happy to get you one. We just got news from uh, yeah. Fort Hood, Texas, that they're at the base that they have, the Army base, that they want to use this. Wow. And they want to use it kind of as a theme song for right. all the new people that come and go and they have right. programs. So they're asking us for some of the brass arrangements. Okay. And we'd like to see this get played on all the Army bases yes. and Navy bases, all the, the, the armed forces bases across the America and around the world. Right. So America, we are one. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. America. these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. <laughs> 
song well the lord blessed with that and uh yeah. so we're looking forward to it making its way around it's on a number of radio stations now being played throughout the country but you brought a great point you said that you know within our church yes that we need to be united we and do so tonight we we have some what i think are great leaders uh in the adventist movement if i can say that uh, and Jim, maybe you could introduce who we have here tonight. Well, we have uh, Pastor Jay Gallimore on my far uh, right here, and he is the president of the Michigan Conference, the Seventh-day Adventist. Hosting ASI this year. Yes, he All is. Right. And Jay, you've been president here for how many years? Actually, for 23 years. Time goes fast, you know. It's wow, hard to it believe. Does. But it's true. Seems longer than that to me, Jay. I'm just teasing, <laughs> but... Uh, you have, uh, you're the longest uh, right now serving president in North American Division. I think and that's a great serving. testimony to your leadership because mm -hmm. your people have confidence in you, continue to return you uh, to that position. Well, and, the Lord's uh, been, been in very Michigan, good. that's quite a that's quite a thing, too. And mm -hmm. uh, so now we've got Pastor, Pastor Stephen Bohr, uh, Secrets Unsealed. Uh, certainly uh, no stranger to 3ABN yeah, and absolutely. to our viewers. And likewise, uh, Pastor Doug Batchelor and, uh, with Amazing Facts, and who was the former pastor of the uh, Sacramento Central Church. Now, you have a church. Are you pastoring a church currently? I am, Jim. I'm currently at the uh, Granite Bay Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay. Which is, it's really okay. a suburb of Sacramento, church we planted about six years ago. Right. All right. So that's tremendous. These are three experienced pastors. Uh, they are three Bible students. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they are individuals who I have a lot of confidence in. Jay and I had uh, served as conference presidents together. There were many times, I must admit, that we were sometimes stood alone on issues uh, it, with all the conference presidents there. <laughs> there may have been some that agreed with us, but they didn't stand with us. And uh, <laughs> so it was, they always knew that uh, Gilly and Gallimore were going to be standing on, <laughs> on an issue together. And, and we, we enjoyed the fellowship of all those conference presidents. That was a tremendous uh, time of fellowship together. Jim, what, what are the, let's talk about the topic for tonight and why. Okay. Why is this topic, why do we, it, we're taking two hours of satellite time, of people's times, of literally reaching around not only Adventist homes, but homes around the world. The topic tonight, what are we talking about the, and, the, and why are we talking about this? The, who is ordina ordained in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in ministry has become a great issue. Okay. Uh, there are, have been two unions that have decided to go ahead and to begin to ordain uh, without uh, obeying what has normally been the view from, from the Bible mm -hmm. and uh, from the church. Uh, and this has brought about a great deal of controversy. Uh, this issue is to be voted on at our general conference next summer, one year from now, a little less than a year now before uh, that general conference session. So what we thought in, in discussion with uh, Pastor Doug Batchelor and with Steve, Pastor Bohr particularly, our people need to know what is the issue? What does the Bible say? And also, we want to somehow begin to hear from the pew itself, rather than uh, necessarily from leaders. Sometimes uh, leaders and committees have, have um, felt like they thought knew what was right w for all of us. And uh, so they begin to vote these things just as if the entire church was for it. 
Well, this past week, we decided to do a survey. Now, this is a straw vote. It's not scientific. We mailed out a questionnaire to just 10,000 people that were on our mailing list. We did not choose those uh, by any, they were randomly cho chosen. We could have gone out to 80, 90, 100,000. We felt like 10,000 was a sampling that's about 10 times what normal uh, pollsters use. So we went with that. And um, I want to share with you the results. The results were really eye-opening because I think that maybe we should do more surveys, more polls. Perhaps every church in North America should do a poll and find out what do our members feel. That poll should be registered with the, with the North American Division so that they understand what the, each church feels. Because I think that this is a very important issue uh, that people right in the pew itself need to be heard. So I especially feel that after this week's uh, survey that was sent out. The first question says, I believe that the scriptures teach women should be ordained as pastors. Now I'm going to ask them to put the uh, graph up on the, the screen. You can see that um, there were 20% of the individuals answered yes, 75.9% of the individuals answered no, and uh, then uh, there was no response from, from uh, the others. Uh, the next question, I, I believe that scriptures teach women should be ordained as elders. Uh, that was, uh, there were 533 people, or 25.1% that voted yes. No was 71.2%. And they had 2,122 people that responded to that. The next question, I believe the Adventist Church needs to create more opportunity, ministry opportunities for women aside for, uh, from ordination as pastors or elders. This was overwhelmingly a yes. 71.1% said yes. 25.9 uh, said no, and uh, there was no answer from uh, only 2.9%. I believe if women's ordination is approved, it will make it easier for same-sex marriage advocates to agitate for acceptance within the church. The reason this question was put in is because this has been the way it has proceeded in other denominations. When they began first with changing their uh, requirements for ordination, the next thing was they began to ordain also gays and also to accept gay marriage. This was been the next thing. So we felt like this was a question. Our people in the pew uh, answered uh, yes by a, a number of 54.5%, no 42.5%. I believe this issue should be conclusively voted at the next general conference meeting and whatever is decided should be unitedly followed by the world church. 46.2% said yes, 49.2% said no. In other words, if you, I don't want to try to translate that. I'm going to let you just read it and see it as it is. There are some people that said, well, if this is what the church votes, yes, I'll go along. 42% said. But 49% said no. Even if the church votes it, I don't believe uh, that I should go along with it. The next says, I believe each Seventh-day Adventist World Division or conference should be allowed to determine the women's ordination issue independently. This was one of the strongest, if not the strongest, responses. In fact, it was the second strongest response of all. 72.7% said no. And 24.8% uh, said yes. I think that shows that our people want a unity within all of the divisions of the church, that we stand together uh, on this question. Now, on the next question, I believe the women's ordination issue may lead to a separation within the Adventist church. 
71.1 said yes. 25.9 said no. I'm hoping that we as a people will stand together and not be divided, regardless of what that vote might be. But uh, as we went out with this survey, we can see that people fear that this will bring about a split or division in our church. The question, are you a denominational employee? And 88% uh, said no. 10% said yes. And the rest of them didn't know. No, I'm just teasing, but uh, there was no response. Uh, we looked at the, no the countries that were involved. I don't have those stats right with me at the moment, but it was a number of countries around the world that were involved. Now, here's the big question. Are you male or female? The answer, male was 45%. Female, 53.5%. So you see, this was not a male vote versus female. It was pretty even and uh, with females feeling uh, exactly that way. And then we go down to the age group. It's broken down by age groups. You can see uh, how that is on the graph. And um, I, I do believe that, you know, no, no survey gives a complete total picture. Uh, whenever you hear them on, on radio or television, they'll say there's a 5% accuracy situation. Well, folks, I think you can see that those at least that answered this survey, and we're going to give you a chance. People have said to me, hey, I didn't get a chance to vote, and we're going to give you a chance to vote. In fact, how, the, how are we going to do that, Doug Batchelor? Do you, you know about that? Tell us what's happening. Yeah, there's a lot of people around the world that said, I'd like to participate in this survey. And so there's two methods. For North America, people can either go by a phone number or an Internet site, and for the rest of the world, an Internet site. And I think Elder Gilly's got um, the phone number there. The phone number is 800-272-1280. And they'll be putting that on the, uh, on the, on the screen. screen. It's there now. 800-272-1280. And what's the email address? Our if a person goes to a website that simply says ordinationsurvey.com, ordinationsurvey.com, and if I'm not mistaken, even Same during this question. broadcast, results can start coming in. They definitely can do so on that uh, uh, yes or no question. They'll be getting those up to us. And just follow the directions when you call that number, and you'll be able to uh, let us know this very night how you feel. Well, what an amazing time to be alive where technology is so in place that just almost anything is possible. Since this is such a um, I think a, a, a serious topic that we're talking about tonight, I think it would only be appropriate if we started out with prayer. So we're going to ask for a couple prayers tonight. Pastor Jay Gallimore and uh, Pastor Steve Bohr, would you lead us? And we're going to ask the folks at home, you be praying also, because all we really want is truth to come out of this tonight. And we want people to see the love of Jesus here tonight. Our dear Heavenly Father, it, it was Jesus who promised to send the Spirit of truth. He promised that He would be the one who would teach us. And he teaches us through His Word. And so we pray tonight that as we work uh, together and think together and examine the evidence from Scripture, that You will indeed be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Father in heaven, we come before You this evening, first of all, to thank You for Your Holy Word which is a sure guide in a world that is so confused. And Father, we ask that you will open minds and hearts as we discuss this is issue this evening. We ask, Lord, that you will remove preconceived notions, and that you will help us hear the testimony of your word, and only that testimony. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, Jim, um, I believe in divine providence. Yes. We had planned this program. We had asked uh, Pastor Doug and Pastor Steve to be here. This afternoon, I was walking from the hotel to the convention center with a group of people, and this something inside me said, 
excuse yourself, you need to go up to your room. And I tried to think, I don't really need to go up to my room, but I just felt this, really, a sense within me that said, you need to go up to your room. So I looked at the folks I was with, I said, I'll meet you over at the convention center, I need to go up to the room for a few moments, and I'll be right over. As I walked in the door of the hotel, and there are many doors and many entrances from many different directions, who did literally, I crossed, the only other person there was Pastor Jay Gallimore. He said, Danny, when you get a chance, I want to talk, spend a few minutes with you. I was hoping to get to see you. And he didn't know that we were having this live program tonight. I said, Pastor Gallimore, Jay, we, we need you tonight. And so thank you, Jay, for being there, for being available, and for joining this group tonight. We're very happy to, happy do to have you. In fact, uh, Pastor Gallimore did not realize he was going to be on here tonight. No, he, didn't. he didn't even have a jacket on. Yeah. Oh, now you're telling everything, okay? <laughs> but Greg, but, Greg's jacket looks good on him. He looks good. He looks good. <laughs> I was grateful for the help. <laughs> well, listen, um, I want us to have kind of a discussion. And we're almost just going to turn these three loose. Absolutely. It's and, time. And let them... Uh, discuss and uh, Doug why don't you start it off and then we'll move right along and you can include everyone as you uh, along the way here well I, I do think of course this is a very important issue um, uh, all of us here have been pastors and things have changed uh, in our church in the last few years where there's been obviously a, a push among some to uh, change the the roles that have traditionally through not only the Adventist church, but through many churches, have been seen between men and women. And it'd probably be good to just begin that uh, I think we all agree that we need to do more to involve every member in ministry. And I think there needs to be increasing opportunities uh, for women to be involved in ministry. We, we need to get every member involved in ministry. Uh, of course, Amazing Facts. Uh, teaches men and women to do evangelism and ministry, and Pastor Bohr is one of our teachers uh, in, in that uh, program. But that said, I think we also agree that sometimes when a pendulum swings, it swings too far. And while there have been abuses and neglect and um, uh, unfair payment for women uh, in recent history, uh, then that needs to be corrected. And uh, opportunities for every member to be involved but there is still a very strong Bible teaching, we believe, that there are distinctions in roles between men and women, uh, both in the family and in the church. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, some people just don't know what the issues are, so we wanted to take some time and just talk about, you know, what does the Bible say about uh, women being ordained as pastors? Is it biblical? And uh, obviously we respect people that might feel differently, but... Uh, it, I think it is an important subject to understand. Well, I, th I, I really appreciate that. This, what this certainly issue is not about, and sometimes gets pushed in that direction, it's not about the fact that women are less valuable than men, or vice versa. God loves his daughters just as much as he loves his sons. And uh, so, but this is about God's way, God's own divine order. He's the creator. He started all of this. And the Adventist church, and I love this church. This is a great church. Uh, no church's uh, operations will ever be perfect because it has poor people like me, and uh, Jim knows that, uh, trying to oversee it. But the, the real issue is uh, what does the Bible teach here? The Adventist Church has always, from its beginning, been a Bible-believing, Bible-practicing church. And we love this church. That's why we're members. That's why millions of members around the world um, embrace the Sabbath. But uh, this, of course, uh, we live in a culture today that puts all kinds of different pressures on it and doesn't respect Scripture. But the church, as members of God's church, we, Scripture has got to have a high view. And so I think that's where we really need to start tonight is to say, what does the Scripture really teach about this subject? I think sometimes the discussion gets distracted by comments such as, well, if you don't believe that there are certain functions in the church that can be filled by women, 
then you don't believe that women are, are equal to men. And that's a false distinction because um, we believe that women and men are equal in dignity and status in the sight of God. But at the same time, we believe in a difference of function or difference of roles. Doesn't mean they're inferior. It's kind of like the father and the son in the Godhead. You know, uh, the son uh, is subject to the father's authority. And yet we would all agree that they're equal. I mean, the father and the son are equal. They're both God. But the son is subject to the father. In other words, there's equality while there's a distinction in function. And I think if people understood that, it would be much easier uh, to accept the idea that there are different roles for men and women within the church. And, and why don't we start with Genesis? Let's just go there. I mean, everything starts with Genesis. Uh, there's no revelation without Genesis. There's no apostles without Genesis. There's no gospel without Genesis. And um, so I don't know which one of you would like to start there, but let's talk about this whole thing called headship. I'm, I've heard some people say, well, that's a recent discovery in the Adventist church. Uh, my understanding is, I think it was right there in Genesis, and Adventists have always embraced Genesis. So maybe let's take a look at what happened before the fall. I don't know which one of you want, I mean, uh, want to take that on. You made a good point when we were just backstage talking, and you, you said, you know, was there a difference in man's work? Was there a difference in, in uh, the woman with childbirth? Why, why don't you repeat what you were sharing with us? Well, I, we know that after the fall, God met with both Adam and Eve, and, and he had some things to say. Um, probably not things they necessarily wanted to hear, but he says to Adam, he says, the ground's not going to do so good for you anymore. Uh, so my question is, uh, was there going to be cultivation, gardening, and so forth before the fall? Well, obviously there was, because God's saying it's going to be tougher now. And then he looks to Eve and he says, you know, childbirth's going to get painful. Well, my question is, was there childbirth before the fall? Well, as long as you've got a man and a woman, there's going to be babies at some point here. So that would have happened. And then he says something about the relationship between man and woman. And um, he talks, the Lord talks about this headship issue, and he says there's, it's going to be tougher now. So my question is, well, was there, was there headship before the fall? Well, the answer is obvious. It was. And all that sin did was interject pain into all three of these areas. But when God created man and woman, I don't think Adam and Eve were arguing with each other, but there was a role and a difference, and, and leadership is influence. So you have... Eve being given the leadership of focusing on the family, children and so forth. You have Adam being given the role of leading the family and protecting the family. Some people say, well, what was there protect against? Well, there was a, there was a Lucifer, and we all know that story. So um, obviously there was headship before the fall. It was very harmonious. I don't think Eve looked at Adam and said, oh, I just wish I had your job. And I don't think Adam looked at Eve and said, I wish I had your job. And it, and it also says, as you get to the end of chapter 2, it says, the man and his wife. The man will cleave to his wife, leave his father and mother, and then, then it ends that by saying the man and his wife. The picture of them are one. And, of course, Jesus affirmed that. So that's my little uh, start on that anyway. Yeah, and then when, um, of course, Paul says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loveth the church. And so the love between Jesus and and his church and the Father and Jesus, as perfect as those are, even though there's a distinction of authority between the Father and the Son, you have the same thing in creation. And so it was, it was a perfect arrangement. And I think Stephen brought out that even among the angels, there's variation of uh, authority. You know, there's one word which is explosive when we come to the issue of women's ordination. And, of course, I was a member, along with Doug, of the Theology of Ordination Committee, and that's the word headship. It is strongly disliked by those who are in favor of women's ordination. And the way that I approach it, I, I ask sometimes, you know, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says that the head of Christ is God, his Father. So I say, is that a bad thing? Well, obviously not. Uh, then he says, the head of the man is Christ. 
So is that a bad thing? Well, no. Then he says, the head of the woman is the man. Is that a bad thing? Yes. <laughs> it doesn't make much sense. I mean, headship, when you understand what true headship means, Jay, uh, it's beautiful. Christ is the head of the church. That doesn't mean that he beats up on the church. Uh, it means that he loves the church. He sacrifices himself for the church. He gives himself for the church. And if husbands are those kinds of heads, I don't think that wives would have any trouble with headship. No, if, they, if Ephesians 5 were taken as the model of headship, uh, the homes would, I think, would be marvelously happy. And men need to take a lesson from the Lord Jesus, who alone is the best model for this whole headship. And Ephesians 5 is often left out of this, and yet it's so affirmed and so powerful. How much did Jesus love his church? Well, he gave his life for the church. How, how much should men who give leadership to their homes love their wives? Well, we should be ready to give our life for our families uh, because God's called us to be servant leaders. And uh, there's a huge difference between that and some of the macho stuff you hear around. Amen. I think we all know that we're living in a culture today that is working on overdrive to eliminate any distinction between men and women. It's true. And so, um, you know, if today, quite honestly, if, if a man acts like a woman, it's celebrated. And if a woman acts like a man, and you know, the Bible says that a woman should not put on a man's clothing and a man should not put on a woman's clothing. So, and that's from God, that's not a cultural thing. And, and so the Lord was saying, I made you different for good reasons. We should celebrate those differences and not try to morph and amalgamate. And within the family and within the church, God said, I've arranged that there's, there's an order, there's a difference. And, right. Yeah, and, and the, and the uh, male and female, that's a reality. That's not, I mean, the world can try to change it, but it's a real issue. And I love what you said. We should celebrate the manliness. We should several, celebrate the femininity. We, we should celebrate these differences. They're not, they're not in competition. They're in cooperation. They're in harmony. That's why God created them to start with. I think Satan is trying to blur everything that God established at creation. You know, he's changed everything. Instead of heterosexual marriage, he says, no, uh, gay marriage is okay. Instead of the Sabbath, he says, Sunday. Instead of the original diet, the devil says, no, you can eat anything. You know, instead of the roles that God established, uh, you know, they say, there's interchangeability of roles. So the devil's target is creation. So that's why we need to go back to creation as the model for roles within uh, marriage as well as within the church. Yeah, and that, that brings up the issue because the ordination issue, uh, and we're not talking about women in ministry. You so nicely talked about that earlier, Doug. Um, I think all of us believe strongly we need women in ministry. Yeah. But we want to make sure it's biblical. I want my role to be biblical. I think uh, women want their role, Christian women want their role to be biblical. But he roots this whole issue of ordination in the creation before, before the fall. And uh, so I, I think at some point we need to discuss what the Apostle Paul was saying when he went over to, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I don't know which one of you want to... Uh, start uh, looking at it, take, taking a look at that. But it can't be ignored. I, for instance, I've heard people say, well, there's nothing that says uh, that a woman cannot be ordained. Well, if you want to get real technical, but if you look at the context, uh, I think there's a pretty strong prohibition against it. Go ahead, Stephen. Well, I have a list here of things that clearly indicate that God established male headship both before and after the fall. Maybe. Steve, let me ask you a question. Are you saying that, that male headship, there seems to be a similarity, not a similarity, but a link between the family and the church? I think that's what you're going to show us here. Yes, there is. Of course, when Adam and Eve were created, there was just a family, and the family was the church. Sure. But as time goes on, yes, there, the male headship in the home spills over into male headship in the church. There's no doubt whatsoever in the Bible and both in the sp and also in the spirit of prophecy. But you know you have several things here I can mention them quickly. First of all, um, Adam was created first. The apostle Paul brings that up. He says he, do he does not allow a woman to uh, teach that is with full ecclesiastical authority when you really study it. 
or to exercise authority over the man because the man was created first. Um, Eve was created from Adam. Paul argues that as well. Eve was created to be Adam's helper. The Apostle Paul uses that argument also for male headship. Uh, before the inception of sin, Adam named Eve, which uh, naming is an exercise of authority. Um, God commanded Adam not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and he was to relay this information to Eve. Uh, the woman led the man into sin, according to the Apostle Paul. He uses that as a postful argument for male headship. Um, you know, God approached Adam first for an explanation. Even though Eve sinned first, God came to Adam and because he held him accountable. Um, Adam named Eve again after sin. Uh, and Paul explicitly says in 1 Corinthians 11 that the man is the head of the woman. Uh, furthermore, in Romans 5, um, Jesus is called the second Adam. So God held Adam accountable for the introduction of sin into the world. And so, you know, there, there are so many indications in Scripture. I have several others, but I don't want to monopolize all of the time that indicate clearly that God established male headship before the fall and that it continues um, under less ideal circumstances after the fall. Well, let's just go back, if you don't mind, for just a moment to that second Adam. Since it was Eve who sinned first, why don't we have a second Eve instead of a second Adam? But you made the point very well, God held Adam responsible for the fall, and Satan had not finished the day until he brought down Adam. And so, uh, but both of them given leadership roles, and Jesus came as the second Adam, and also as the seed of the woman, and it was in that role as the second Adam and the seed of the woman that he reclaimed Eden and redemption for us. You know, one reason I think this is a, a very critical issue, um, the devil is trying to do all he can in the last days to erase the image of God from man. And when he made man and woman in the beginning, they reflected the image of God. But they reflected the image of God the way he made them, which was with their distinctions. And so the devil's trying to do everything he can to blur and erase or confuse the, the beautiful distinctions that God made in mankind because um, it actually affects the family. And I think everyone knows that there's terrible breakdown in the families of the world right now. And I, the idea that amalgamating and pretending that there aren't these unique biblical differences is somehow going to help families be stronger has not been proven by history. It actually shows the other. Yeah, in fact, uh, a big issue here is we want strong families. We want husbands to be the leaders of their wives and the wives to be that uh, influence on their, on their children. Let's go back over to, to uh, 2 Timothy and take a look at that. Uh, uh, I don't know which one of you want to uh, move into that, but let's take a look at those verses. Uh, it says, uh, actually, if you want to start with verse 9, it starts talking about women. Earlier it says, let men... Um, be praying and then he has some issues that he raises for women on modesty and of course modesty is a good thing for men as well but uh, then verse 11 and actually there's no most people know this that the Greek doesn't have the chapter div divisions and the verse divisions. so chapter 2 and chapter 3 just run together They're really all in the same context here so uh, maybe you'd like to start uh, giving us some help. Which one of you want to move in on that? Well, it's, um, it's 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 11 and 12, uh, where the Apostle Paul says, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And then in verse 12 he says, I do not permit a woman to teach. That's a special word in Greek. It's not the common word for teach. Or to have authority over a man but to be in silence. And then he gives a rationale for that, and the rationale is based on God's plan before sin. He gives actually two reasons. He says for Adam, that is because Adam was formed first, then Eve. And then he gives a second reason, which is a post-fall reason, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And it's interesting that uh, 
when you really look at uh, the story of the fall, what Adam did was he relinquished his leadership role because instead of listening to the voice of his head, which was Christ, he listened to the voice of his wife. She became his head. In other words, there was a reversal of roles that actually led into sin because Adam should have been caring for Eve. He should have, as Ellen White says, he should have been her protector. He should have not let her go, gone astray, permitted her to go astray from his side. And, uh, and so uh, very clearly the Apostle Paul gives a pre-fall reason and a post-fall reason for his counsel. I, I think that's very fascinating. Um, when, e when Adam sees Eve with those the hands filled with a forbidden fruit, I mean, he loves this woman. This woman is uh, just part and parcel of himself, literally. And he had a fundamental choice at that point. And that choice was, was he going to love the giver more than he loved the gift? And uh, we all know the choice he made, and it turned out to be a very tragic choice for the entire world. But you're so right. He left his leadership responsibilities. He should have never let her be away from his side. Had Adam been at that tree, I don't think Eve would have ever uh, eaten that fruit or touched that because he'd have recognized right off the bat what was happening there. And, and Paul, you're so right. He anchors this thing right there in both uh, the pre- and post-fall. Come to that word silence, and because some people say, oh, you just want women to never to utter a word. Of course, the Apostle Paul is clear that uh, women have roles in the church, and that doesn't mean silence. And he even talks about them having teaching roles in the church. But this silence is, uh, is a different kind of a thing in the context. Would you like to speak to that? Well, uh, Ellen White, I think, is helpful when it comes to uh, this particular question. Um, you know, when, when you take a look at the ordination of Paul and Barnabas, for example, what did that act confer upon Paul and Barnabas? Well, ordination does not impart any supernatural power. Sure. It's a recognition by the church that the individual has been called to that particular function in the church. Uh, but Ellen White, commenting about Paul and Barnabas, says that when they were ordained, they were able to teach and speak with full ecclesiastical authority. Mm. Uh, in other words, they, they had the sanction of the church to be spokespersons for the church officially. Um, you know, when it comes to women, can women teach a Sabbath school class? Sure. Can they preach during the worship service? Absolutely. Can they give Bible studies? Absolutely. But they cannot be ordained to speak with full ecclesiastical authority, and that means uh, also uh, the ordinances and baptism and organizing churches. That is reserved by the Lord for males. It doesn't mean that males are superior. It's just simply God has established that as the order in the church. Yeah, there, there's a big difference between gifts and office. And that's what you're really saying. Uh, when Barnabas was ordained, it wasn't a gift of ordination. It was an office of ordination. And there's a huge, huge difference in that. And we all talk more about those gifts. Doug, you want to weigh in on some of this? Well, I've got to pace myself. Like, you know, when you get your kids a motorcycle, it's got a governor on it to make sure that it doesn't get carried away and nobody gets hurt. Um, for me, it's really been a struggle because, uh, I, you know, I grew up in a background with my, my mother was a leader in New York City of a, right at the epicenter of what we now call the feminist movement. It was a women's lib movement back then. And I grew up just, you know, being very passionate about the injustice and, and the rights. And then when I started seeing this issue coming into the church, I said, well, Lord, I just want to find out what your word says. And... Uh, even though sometimes I didn't always understand, I, I want to be consistent with the word. And we have to ask ourselves, this, this uh, campaign or this pressure to erase these differences, these distinctions, these roles, uh, is it biblically driven or is it driven by our culture? Mm -hmm. And when I read the Bible, I think backstage, I just, I quickly, with you, Jay, I think when I went over a list, I just made for myself, and I think there's a dozen points here, Following the Garden of Eden, God established male spiritual headship within the family and the church. And I used the verses in Timothy we just used. Only men were ever authorized to officiate in offering a sacrifice, baptism, what we would call communion today. 
While the Lord called the entire nation of Israel to be priests, only men were asked to serve in the capacity of priests in the sanctuary. Now the women were considered the daughters of Aaron, like Elizabeth was a daughter of Aaron. So they were part of the priesthood, but there are things they didn't do. And so yes, we are a nation of kings and priests, but there are certain roles that still should just be for the men. While Jesus desired women to help share the gospel, he called only men to serve in the capacity of apostle. When Judas died, his replacement was chosen from among two men, even though there were 120 men and women in the upper room. In fact, uh, just stopping on that point, Mary Magdalene might have been up there, probably was. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was up there. These are outstanding women, and, and you read about them. And probably Mary Magdalene, there's probably no more devoted disciple of the Lord Jesus than, than Mary Magdalene. In fact, uh, you know, he defended her in front of all of his apostles at Simon's house, and yet uh, she wasn't part of that uh, pool that they drove from. But, you know, what's interesting is the women who were present there were not even considered. Correct. Because when you look at the word that's used for the pool from which the two were chosen, it's the word adelphoi, which means from among the brothers that are gathered here, let's choose two. And there is the feminine, which is adelphe, and that's not used. So in other words, even though there were women there, they were not in the running for that position. It was only from among the brethren that were present there. Yeah. Well, Doug, let's get back to your list. That was a very good one. I well, I needed a governor. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, okay. Uh, the New Testament begins by tracing the genealogy of Jesus through the male lineage. Uh, you know, while uh, four women are mentioned, and they, they could be mentioned because it may be all four of them actually were Gentiles. We're not sure about Bathsheba, but Tamar, Rahab, Ruth. Um, and while Jesus desired that women share the gospel, he only had uh, men, oh, I mentioned that one. Uh, both men and women were baptized, but only men are recorded as performing baptisms in the Bible. The first seven deacons to administrate, it says, again, they choose men or chose men. As Paul went from town to town, he ordained elders. Um, only kings that were anointed, there were only men that were anointed as kings of the books in the Bible. Uh, two are named after women, Ruth and Esther, but most commentators agree that all the books in the Bible were written by the men. And, uh, and I should probably stop here because what about women prophets? Um, you know, I always thought it was interesting that Amram and Jochebed had three children that were all three prophets, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, not in that order. But only the boys served in capacity of priest. But all three of them were prophets. All the patriarchal blessings were passed down from fathers to the sons. Um, and even when you get to heaven, when it talks about the names in the 12 foundations, they're the apostles, and the names above the gates, are they're the apostles, uh, or they're the tribes rather, which were all men names. And so I just, as I read through the Bible, I see that God, for whatever reason, he establishes a pattern here. You know, and uh, also, if you look at some other cases in the Old Testament, for example, the 70 that were chosen to help Moses with, with the administrative aspects of the mm -hmm. nation were all men. Right. The 70 that Jesus chose were all men and the leaders of, of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens were all men as well. And so there, there are many other cases in the, in, throughout Scripture that show that l these leadership positions were occupied by men, not because God is anti-woman, but because God knows the makeup of men and women, and He knows who needs to fulfill specific roles. Now, I hate using the term devil's advocate, but let, let me advocate for a moment for people that might feel differently. Um, I would say that the reason the Lord did that during these Bible times is because it was a very uh, heavily steeped patriarchal culture and the Lord knew in order for them to function he would have to respect that. And so it was really uh, those laws and those examples were just as a result of the times that they lived in. So what you're saying is that uh, nobody understood this until the 60s, right? <laughs> well, I'm saying that's, that's the argument that we often hear. You know, you look at the history of the Christian church. Uh, you know, primarily in the decade of the 60s, you have this drumbeat to ordain women to the gospel ministry. Before that, 
these texts were interpreted the way that the Adventist Church has always interpreted these texts. That is, distinct roles for men and for women in the church and in the home. So, you know, if you look just at history, apart from the Bible, because the Bible, I believe, is very clear, you find that there is an agenda, there's a cultural agenda in recent times that is in favor of ordaining women, and eventually it will lead to other things as well. Well, listen, we're down to under a minute before our break, and this is extremely interesting, Danny. It really is, and what I appreciate is every one of these gentlemen, these brothers, you see a love shining yeah. out of them. Yeah, that's So we're true. not here to, while we're talking, and it doesn't always happen. I've done over 10,000 <laughs> interviews, so it doesn't always happen when you get a group of, of brothers or sisters in the church that we all can be, but there's such love coming out, yeah. and, and it's basically you all just want truth. That's what I'm saying. No one here has an agenda, Jim, no. to say, okay, I support this, I support that. Every one of you, and I talked to you before the program, and of course we know you well, you just want whatever the Bible says. Whatever the Bible teaches, whatever truth is, that's what we want to be a part of, and that's what we want to disseminate. So thank you for that. Well, listen, uh, you call a friend, tell them to join us. We're going to take a little break right now, and then we'll be right back right after this. Welcome back, and we're happy that you could join us. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want one more time want to say how much I appreciate the preparatory work that C.A. Murray did Absolutely. on this program tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, he helped put the finishing touches and uh, uh, in cooperation with our guests for the survey that went out. That's been so valuable in our discussion. And we still want you to have an opportunity to respond. And if you'll give us a call, you can call that number. It should be on your screen right now, 800-272-1280. And uh, just follow the prompts there. It will tell you how to respond. Or go to the website, and the website is um, ordinationsurvey.com. That also is on the bottom third of your screen. Well, Danny, I'm, I'm learning a lot tonight. I really well, me am. too. A absolutely. And, and we want you to be a part of it. And it, it hit me a little earlier. While these surveys are great and, and, and you know, it shows 75% say no or 25% say yes, all of that's good information. But still yet, the bottom line is, what's the Bible say? So yeah. this is not about politics, but it is, is interesting to hear what members around the world church have to say on this topic. There's been a lot said, and, and I don't like to use the term sides, but in, in, in our humanness, sometimes we, there is sides, and so we get together, we meet, we try to talk together, communicate together to, to where there's division to put that aside and come together for truth. But the fact is, what we're looking at tonight and what we've been praying for is that we, God would give us discernment, would Amen. give us truth, as a church, as a people, not just a layman, but our leadership, all of us. And that's why we've asked these gentlemen tonight, because it seems like sometimes there's more information coming from other sides than there are from, from, from this side of it. And so I think we want to just make sure that, that we're doing according to the Bible and really understanding this topic of women's ordination. But one thing I do want to say for the future here, you guys sound like and I'm, we, we may have to talk this up, and I'm going to be here because I've done a lot of interviews and I listen to folks at home. I've heard two or three hints of that women's ordination have something to do either now or down the road with things even such as homosexual marriages. So I've heard a few hints of that. So you may be somebody's listening at home and they're saying, I think, Doug, you're taking that too far. I've already heard a couple things. So in this conversation, we want to understand when we go to step one, what happens step two and step three, and we have to look down the road away. So tonight, 
Call your friends, call your enemies, call everybody you know. Tell them to tune in to 3ABN right now. And you too can be a part of this by calling the number that's on the screen to be a part of this survey. All right, that's very good. And one of the things that we've talked about is looking at unity. The spirit of unity is not what the Bible teaches. You see, they were unified at the Tower of Babel. Uh, they were unified when they crucified Christ. You can have unity in the wrong direction. But we're talking about the unity of the spirit, not the spirit of unity. And this is a very important difference. That we must be led by the spirit of God and not by led by just unifying on a question or a point. Well, let's get back. And Doug, you've got some uh, figures, I think, from uh, the survey that's going on right now that people are responding in. Yeah, and I need to thank the, the technicians that are behind the curtain. They, I, they showed me how to uh, just pull this up on my iPad. But for those that are calling that number that you just gave, they're doing the survey right now. About 200 have called in. And the, the results look even stronger than, than the first one. Regarding the question, should only men be ordained? Uh, here it says 91% say yes. Wow. Uh, should women be ordained as elders? 91% here are saying no. And I got a witness here, Pastor Boer's looking at the pie chart with me. Um, <laughs> we need more paid ministry opportunities for women. And 65% are saying yes. Uh, if women's ordination is approved, will it help contribute to same-sex marriage? 87% are saying yes. And that was your, your question. People are concerned. There's a connection. And uh, I don't know that I'll read through them all, but I, this wow. is actually a live report. It's changing as I sit here. Pastor right. Jay, what do you think about that? Well, I, I think uh, it demonstrates that people that are listening are saying, what does the Bible say? You, you know, at the end of the day, you just mentioned a very good thing, Brother Jim, about unity. Uh, the church can never afford to go to political decisions no, on something like right. this. Exactly. What we must do is make decisions based on Scripture. Yes. And that's going to run against culture. We, we keep the Sabbath not because it's culturally uh, easy, but we do that because it's scriptural. And uh, we've never believed that the Bible uh, did not contain truth or that truth is culturally conditioned. No, truth is always truth. And it's always going to be truth. So, yeah, we, we've got to make decisions based on scripture, yes. not political decisions. That's right. You know, I, uh, I would like to hear from Doug. I know Doug has done a lot of research into one step leading to another. And so, Doug, could you share some of those things with us about uh, one step leading to the next? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll do this just from memory, but anyone can actually um, find the results of this. You can see a pattern in history. We're not the first church that's grappling with this issue. And uh, all you have to do is read the headlines, and I think we saw the Anglican Church just voted to approve the uh, ordination of uh, homosexuals. And there's a battle within the um, uh, Methodist Church. Now, the American Methodist Church uh, years ago began ordaining um, uh, gay clergy and uh, solemnizing um, same-sex marriages. but. Um, the Baptist Church, on the other hand, they, they started doing that, and then they had a very important convention, and they really went into a deep Bible study. They overturned it, and the, the thing that we see is with the Pres uh, Presbyterian Church, the American Presbyterian Church, the Lutheran Church, the Episcopalian Church, and many others I could mention, it seemed like in every case a few important things happened. When they got to the point where they said, for the sake of political correctness or culture, whatever their reasons might be, we need to now uh, treat ordination as though there's no difference between men and women. That, in all those cases I just mentioned, ultimately led to recognizing same-sex marriage. But also, almost as interesting, they, they advocated this saying, this is going to be the panacea for great evangelism. If we could just start m empowering women as pastors, the gospel will go to the world. But in all those churches I just mentioned, their membership and evangelism dropped off a cliff. In the case of the Presbyterian Church in 40 years, 50% loss from over 4 million to just under 2 million. And so the idea that this is going to just help great growth, um, and many churches, even in the Methodist Church, whole congregations are leaving the denomination 
as the denomination is making uh, moves away from the Bible, they're saying we're going to go find another church that follows the Bible. So I think the best key for evangelism, just you know, based on some of these patterns, is stick with the scriptures and do it Jesus' way. And you know, Doug, that, that shows what happens when leadership, church leadership, doesn't follow scripture. Uh, their results, they may get their way, but there are, there's consequences. Well, I'm, I'm going to come back to this thing just for a moment. Uh, many people who are uh, pr proponents of ordaining women, very fine people, many of them, and uh, will tell you that they're certainly against homosexual marriage. So wh what is the connection here? It, it, it's a word we often call hermeneutics. Uh, it's another long word, really simply means methods of Bible study. How is it that the methods of Bible study end up that allow, that allow people to ordain uh, women to the office of, uh, of the ministry or elder? How does that hermeneutic or that method of Bible study open the door to homosexual marriage? That's the real issue here. Steve, you've got your black belt in that subject. Go ahead. Well, you know, I firmly believe that those who favor women's ordination in the Adventist church, they do not see the implications. You know, they don't see that their hermeneutical methods or their methods of interpretation will lead to the next step. I believe they're sincere. They love the Lord, but they don't see you know, what has already been shown in other churches. Um, let me just give you a couple of examples of uh, arguments that are used by those who favor women's, women's ordination who also favor uh, gay pastors and gay marriage. Galatians 3.28 is used by both groups. There's neither male nor female. Well, the argument is if there's neither male nor female, we can ordain men and women. The homosexual lobby says if there's no male or female, you know, we can have uh, gay marriage and gay pastors. Uh, so that's one. Another argument which appears very frequently is the matter of justice and mercy yes. for both groups, justice and mercy. And in both groups, there's tremendous pressure against those who oppose the desire for women's ordination or for gay marriage. In fact, those who are opposed that are called fundamentalists or extremists. And that's used as a, as a means of pressuring individuals into accepting a view that I don't believe is found in the Bible. Well, we, and with the kids, we call it peer pressure. Right. And there's a lot of peers in the work, too. <laughs> if we use the approach, hermeneutic principle of Bible study, that we're to wear special glasses when we read the Bible, and the, the glasses are you interpret the Bible through culture. Um, if, if we approach the Bible that way, I think we're soon going to find that, I mean, let's admit it, our church practices foot washing. We have a command of Jesus in John 13 about that, but if it wasn't for the Bible, how many people in North America traditionally wash the feet of their company? And we're doing that purely because Jesus commanded it when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. So, and if we're, you know, keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath, but if our culture really recognizes Sunday as the most convenient day with, you know, work schedules and so forth, and wouldn't it be more culturally relevant to say, let's keep the popular day? And the whole Bible uh, turns into, um, uh, you know, the teachings kind of turn into a house of cards that implode. I, I was in a meeting and a person was making a presentation on a very fine person, um, and the person said, well, you know what? We, we have one hermeneutic for the Sabbath and the state of the dead, and we have another hermeneutic for uh, the ordination issue. And that, that really turned on my uh, caution lights and red lights. And I said to myself, what are we going to say to our Sunday-keeping friends? We say, you know what? We have this hermeneutic for, for the Sabbath, but we've got a different method of Bible study to arrive at the ordination of women. My my understanding is you better keep that hermeneutic the same, but you can't just pick and choose or make up new ones. We all believe in principles in Scripture and understand how that works, but principles do not undo or overthrow the plain teachings of Scripture. And uh, really, I don't think the, Paul, the Apostle Paul is uh, uh, very fuzzy here about this whole thing. He says, I do not 
allow a woman to exercise authority over a man in, in, a, in that ecclesiastical family setting. And then it goes right into the ordination of, of the elder, and it says it has to be the husband and one wife. Well, some people try to separate that out. And they say, well, you know, the, the, the woman there could, could still be the elder. Well, if, if Paul allows no woman to exercise authority over the man, and then you ordain her as an elder, and her husband's part of the congregation, then, I'm, you know, it, it makes a real interesting uh, dynamic. You know, and sometimes what happens is uh, those who favor um, modified hermeneutic for the Adventist church when it comes to the ordination of women will take uh, cases in scripture like, for example, the veil. They say, well, you know, that passage doesn't apply to us today where Paul says that the woman should wear the veil in the worship service because women don't wear veils. But what they fail to, to say is that um, the veil is the way in which you manifest the principle in, in the culture. Let me give you an example. If you, if you have a pile of books, and, and by the way, this is a real example from my own experience. I went to somebody's house, and uh, it was an Adventist, and he had a fi pile of books, and the Bible was at the bottom of all of the books. So I looked at him and I said, listen, don't you know that the Bible is supposed to be on top of all of the books, not on the bottom? He says, it depends how you look at it. He says, you believe that it's on top because the Bible is above everything, but I, I put it on the bottom because it's the foundation of everything. And so the question is, who's right? Both are right. The principle is reverence for scripture. The way in which it is expressed is different. And you know, the same thing with meat offered to idols, if you want for a biblical example. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter eight, uh, you know, the, there were the weak in the church who were aggravated because uh, church members were going uh, and they were buying meat offered to idols and they were eating it. Well, the Apostle Paul says, you know, that doesn't contaminate you, but if you see that your weaker brother is offended by it, don't do it. Now, today we don't buy meat that was offered to idols in supermarkets, but does the principle apply? The principle of love for your brother still applies, even though the way in which the principle is expressed is different. Very nice, please. Yeah, right along with that, I think we all know you can go to some churches where if you walk in barefoot, they're going to think it's disrespectful. And then there are parts of the world where if you walk in with your shoes on, they're going to think it's disrespectful. And those are just cultural things. The principle is respect in your attire in worship. And you know, another thing that is used is the holy kiss. They say, we don't give holy kisses. We'll just go to Cuba and you'll see all the holy kisses you get from the women. Or Argentina. Yeah, Argentina too. That's right. And in this case, the principle is that God, by his own divine order, set the man to be the leader of his family and the church. We, taught, we raised this issue a while ago, and I think we ought to go back to it, and that is the priesthood of all believers. So we talk about Galatians 3.28, but some people say, well, we're the priesthood of all believers, so we can ordain anybody that we want. Well, where did that whole concept of the New in the New Testament come from of the priesthood of all believers? Doug? Well, I'll touch on it. I, I'm sure that uh, you folks could elaborate better. But um, in the Bible, there's a, in the New Testament time, when the veil was rent uh, from top to bottom and with Christ's crucifixion, we know that that showed the sacrificial system was done away with. It's also interesting, not only was the veil rent, but the high priest rent his garments that day too, uh, Caiaphas. And um, Jesus now said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Speaking of his body or the church, Paul said, Christ is the cornerstone. We are built up, uh, we're living stones, Peter says, built up to a spiritual house. And so there is, in a sense, uh, this spiritual body of Christ, spiritual temple. And we are all to make atonement in bringing others to Christ in this, you know, spiritual sense. But when Paul said, I'm sorry, when Peter says, that you're a holy nation, a uh, royal priesthood, he's quoting Moses, that they were to be a nation of kings and priests. So Peter's quoting Moses, and back in Moses' day, they were the whole nation was to be a nation of priests, but there was still a distinction of roles between the men and the women in the priesthood. And it's interesting, not only were the priests male, but the kings too. So God says to Israel, you know, you are a royal priesthood, but even though all of them were a royal priesthood, 
males were the kings and males were the priests. And by the way, uh, Peter quotes this passage from the Old Testament. Yes. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10, he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, uh, his own special people. And then it, it's, it explains that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. All Christians are called upon to proclaim the marvelous light of the gospel. In the Old Testament, even though Israel were uh, priests and kings, all of them, there were only uh, there was a, a group that was male that were the priests and the kings. And so in the New Testament, even though all are supposed to be kings and priests, God has reserved the specific role of pastor or elder to the male gender. So what you're saying is that God didn't change his principles. The church is now the new Israel. We, I don't think anybody really disagrees with that around here. It's the new Israel. And so his principles of leadership follow right into the New Testament, just as it did from the old. Well, what we'd like to do is get our viewers, you can weigh in on this. The number, we'll put it up on the screen, that you can call. And Doug Bachelor is actually receiving some of the results of a survey, if you would like to take it. And uh, I can't see the number from here, but you can, I'm sure, at home. You got it, Jim? 800-272-1280. 800-272-1280. I'm sitting here listening to, to all of you guys. Pardon me, Danny, for those overseas, there's a website. Okay. And it's simply ordinationsurvey.com. So everyone in the world watching. Okay. This, I'm listening to, to you all speak, and it kind of reminds me, now I'm going to come from a, the layman standpoint, but kind of reminds me of, of conversations that I've had and that most of us as Seventh-day Adventists have had with our friends who are Christians of other denominations who go to church Sunday, for instance. There's always a scripture or two that they bring up about the first day, but when we really look at the overwhelming evidence, and someone told me this years ago, Richard Blandu from United Prison Ministry said, when I go into prisons, maybe a lot of you folk don't realize it, but there are people right here in the United States of America that never heard of the name of Jesus except in a cursing form. But when we give them a Bible, we come back, they always say, why do people go to church on Sunday? Yep. Because no one has ever been there to say, you know, uh, they're just reading the Bible for what it says, seven-day Sabbath, but because of culture, because of, you know, generation after generation, people keep Sunday. And so I even one time on the air, people were calling and we were taking live calls and someone said, well, I know that the Sabbath has been changed. So I said, okay, for any of you who can show me from the Bible that the Sabbath has been changed, we'll give you a million dollars. Now, I said, you don't from Saturday to Sunday. So uh, you don't have to hurry. Just call your pastor and have him give you those scriptures and call back. Well, as you can imagine, no one really did. But this kind of reminds me of that kind of conversation. Only now, sometimes we as Adventists consider ourselves thinkers. And Jim said to be an Adventist, you have to be a little different because you have to be willing to stand up against those around you. A lot of times you're in the minority group. But this sounds to me like I've just this conversation of us having it within the church, uh, my question, I guess, is why? Because it seems like the Bible, the overwhelming truth is there, but there's some reason that we're still so many people wanting to do this. And I think you're talking about culture and, and the times in which we're living. Rather, we've taken our eyes maybe off of the Word of God and uh, trying to please those around us. You know, Danny, let me just add to what you're saying here. Uh, this is one of the things that our survey has shown. We say, well, you don't vote something. No, you don't. But this survey shows that our people in the pew understand truth. They understand what the Bible says. There may be some people that are swayed somehow by culture and so forth or by the uh, political environment. But for the most part, our people have said, this is a thus saith the Lord. I know what God says in his word, and they are just as sure about what God says in his word on this subject as they are on the Sabbath or the state of the dead. And we need to listen to brother and sister common Adventist Christian. 
because they are Bible students. They study their Sabbath school lesson every week. And I will tell you, after five years, if you study your Sabbath school lesson every single week after five years, it's like a college education as far as theology is concerned. You learn so much, particularly if you read the Spirit of Prophecy Helps and you really get into that Sabbath school lesson. I've seen it change the uh, intellectual ability even of people who I thought were very ordinary and they become profound in their study of God's Word. So our people do understand and leadership needs to be listening to the people in this case instead of vice versa. I think this problem could be resolved very easily with the technology that we have. Just do this survey with every person in every church of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. That's the most democratic way of doing it. it is. And I'll bet you anything that I can tell you what the results are going to be. One of the problems I think we have, though, as I've traveled, uh, you know, I travel a lot to Latin America, is people are not well informed on all of these issues because they haven't studied them out. Basically, it runs something like this. Um, do you believe that men and women are equal? And I say, yes. So why can't men and women be pastors? That's the extent of the knowledge of many. And th that's the reason why they need to be informed. But unfortunately... That's like saying, what difference does it make what day you keep? Just one in seven will do, right? right? But unfortunately, Danny, the publicity has been one-sided on this. And I appreciate 3ABM being willing to present the other side of the issue because most of the denominational uh, media, that is uh, the union papers and, and the other outlets, have presented only one side. In fact, they openly said, we're only presenting one side. And so it's necessary to get this information out to everyone so that they can look at the other side. Let's get back to something. Yeah, that was great. I appreciate the exchange. It was excellent. Let's get back to something uh, on this office and spiritual gifts for just a moment. Um, people have said, I think, uh, Doug, you may have mentioned earlier, some people say, well, you know, Ellen White had the prophetic gifts, so why wasn't she ordained? Uh, isn't it okay then to ordain women? We have a woman prophet in this church uh, who had the prophetic gift. But uh, there's a difference. Everybody could have spiritual gifts. Men, women, children, whoever God wanted to give it to, because he's giving those gifts. But uh, the office is not a gift. That's something that's set aside to lead the church, to give leadership to the church, just like you have for the home. Any of you guys want to weigh in on that? Well, one thing you brought up I think is very important is uh, we do, of course, the Seventh-day Adventists believe in the inspiration that God called Ellen White, that he inspired her, that he led her. And that's not the first time in biblical history from Old and New Testament uh, there were men and women that God spoke to in a supernatural way. Um, one of the urban myths that was going through our denomination is that there was at one time some secret ordination service for Ellen White. And one thing that uh, we were happy came out very clearly when we were at the ordination uh, meeting is they went through all of the history and there was no record that there was ever any ordination service. Ellen White never claimed to be, no one else ever claimed, uh, none of her contemporaries that she had been ordained as a pastor. Which is amazing when you think about it. She had huge amounts of influence, of course, in the church, but she was never elected to any office, never had any overseer rules, even subjected herself to the brethren who wanted her to go to Australia, and she didn't, wasn't sure it was totally the right thing to do, but she went. And why? Because she respected the people that were, that God had set aside to give leadership to the church. And prophets many times gave counsel to leaders, but the leaders could decide to follow the counsel or not. Actually, the prophets were counselors to the leaders. The prophets were not the leaders. They counseled the leaders on what to do, but then the leader decided whether they were going to do it or not. So they were God's, directly God's spokesman between God and the leader. That's another thing that we hear sometimes. We hear that, you know, the Bible has a trajectory, and the trajectory over time does away with slavery. It throws out polygamy. Um, so um, uh, what do you think about that? Well, when, when I think trajectory, I'm a pilot 
and you know rockets have a trajectory and it's usually some kind of an arc when you're coming in for a landing you want to set up for your approach and uh, it, it's usually a gradual descent or a climb out but what we see historically is that from the time of Adam up until about a hundred years ago now for our church it was more in the 60s but for some churches it was a little further back that there was almost a universal understanding that there's these biblical distinctions and I like to read a lot of the commentators. I mean, I read Spurgeon and Matthew Henry and Adam Clark and John Gill, and none of them ever questioned how to interpret these Bible verses until lately. And yet people are saying, but there's been this growth, there's been this trajectory of understanding that has gradually brought us to this point. Uh, but I just don't see historically or biblically anything gradual has happened. It's been ra rather sudden. Well, actually, the early Adventists were uh, abolitionists. They hated slavery, and they never mixed the two up. They didn't see a problem. Uh, they only ordained the men. I think the truth is that there is a trajectory in Scripture that overthrows polygamy and slavery, but polygamy and slavery came in after the fall, not before the fall. There's no trajectory to overthrow what God created and He called good. And uh, he created male and female and gave them their roles. And that's good. And Paul roots the ordination of elders in that divine order before the fall. As I've read the evangelical literature on um, Galatians 3.28, for example, uh, those who are in favor of women's ordination, uh, they say, well, there's even a trajectory in the New Testament because uh, you have... Um, you know, First Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 where it says that uh, the elder should be the husband of one wife. But they say when Paul wrote Galatians, there's neither male nor female. He had grown in the trajectory. The only problem with that argument is that Galatians was written long before First and Second Timothy. And so, if anything, the Apostle Paul changed from being egalitarian to, uh, to the man occupying the position of leadership in the church. You know, doesn't it always worry you when people make Paul at war with himself or the Holy Spirit at war with himself? You know, he's not going to say in one place uh, that I do not allow a woman to exercise authority over a man in this ecclesiastical things we've talked about uh, or in the home. But, uh, and then turn around and say, no, he didn't really mean what he said in Galatians 3.28. Uh, Paul is not at war with himself and neither is the Holy Spirit. And... Uh, so just to throw these out as some kind of a cultural thing, I think uh, misses the whole point. Now, I just wanted to mention something about um, what you were talking about, the uh, difference between a spiritual gift and a church office. Uh, a church, off, uh, a church uh, office is not given to new believers. The Apostle Paul clearly says that a neophyte, which is a new believer, cannot be an elder of the church they have to have a track record. However, a spiritual gift is given at the moment of baptism. It has nothing to do with, with maturity in the faith. And so that shows clearly that there's a distinction between a spiritual gift that is given at the moment of baptism and a church office that is given after a period where the person has a proven track record that they are uh, able to fill that position. That's very good. I've not seen that before. It's excellent. You know, that raised something that we brought up just a moment ago. Um, there is a statement where Ellen White talks about that women should be pastors of the flock. And that's often been used. I, I've, I've had some friends that said, wow, I never saw that before. And, um, uh, of course, this is one statement out of hundreds of thousands. But she's using the word pastor there in sort of the classical sense of someone who helps shepherd sheep. I mean, Jacob when he found Rachel, she was pastoring her father's sheep, as was Moses when he found uh, the daughters of Jethro. They were pastoring their father's sheep. And so women are also involved in helping pastor the flock, feed the sheep. Um, that's a completely different use than when she talks about women being ordained as ordained ministers or pastors. Yeah, the, the office of the elder, we mix those terms up nowadays quite a bit. We mix up the term pastor and elder uh, back and forth. But the elder was the presiding officer. The, he was the overseer of the church. He was the designated leader of the church. But, uh, and she said that, by the way, in the context of uh, canvassing. And, uh, and there are nurturing 
beautiful nurturing skills and gifts that God gives to women, and we need those skills. Uh, we need women in the church. We need to be involved in the church. Uh, and in fact, I don't think we've opened up enough things for women to do. There's many offices that, uh, that are able to hold. And, and I mean, I have people in my office. Uh, our uh, superintendent of education is a, a lady who has a wonderful gifts of administration. But God reserves that one office for men uh, because he's consistent in his divine order through the Old Testament, creation, and his church. We don't want to, to be seen as the party of no. <laughs> well, I, I think the issue is we, we're, we want to be pro-Scripture. That's the real issue here. And, uh, and God loves his daughters, as I said earlier, as much as he loves his sons, and he's got a lot for them to do. Well, let me ask you, let me ask, I, I think I'm probably safe. Most of us would say that our mothers had more influence on us than anyone. And there's uh, a quote by, I think it was uh, John Maxwell, who said, uh, leadership is influence, nothing less, nothing more. So God gave women a fantastic leadership opportunity because they're the closest to their kids. I mean, I love my kids, and they'll call me, but you know who they call first, even though they're, they're grown? They call mama. And that's because God put her in that position to be closest to them and to have the most influence on them. Yeah, especially if they want permission, they call mom first, <laughs> is what I found. Uh, maybe, maybe I can just read uh, three statements that are frequently misinterpreted uh, from Ellen White. The first one is the one that was referred to. It is the accompaniment of the Holy Spirit of God that prepares workers, both men and women, to become pastors to the flock of God. The fact is that Technically speaking, according to the New Testament, pastor is a spiritual gift. But we use it differently today in the sense of minister. We've changed the meaning of the word as we use it today. Very true. Uh, so, uh, you know, she's saying that men and women should be shepherds because the word pastor means shepherd. In Spanish, there's only one word, pastor. You should know that. You have Hispanic pastors in your conference. The second one is uh, the primary object of our college was to afford young men an opportunity to study for the ministry and to prepare young persons of both sexes to become workers in the various branches of the cause. But you'll notice that she, she spe speaks first of all about young men an opportunity to study for the ministry and then she says and to prepare young persons of both sexes to become workers in the various branches of the cause. So she's, she's saying that so there's a role for, for ministers and then there's a role for both men and women. The third one, those who enter the missionary field should be men and women who walk and talk with God. Period. And then she says those who stand as ministers in the sacred desk should be men of blameless reputation. So she's making a distinction between men and women uh, in this statement who walk and talk with God and ministers who are men who stand at the sacred desk. Yeah, she makes a difference between that elder, office of the elder, and the fact that everybody needs to be involved in ministry, including our sisters and our wives and our daughters uh, in Christ. You know, in the book, along lines with that, um, I, I recommend anybody that reads the book, Acts of the Apostles, if they read the chapter where she talks about um, the ordaining uh, the ordination, uh, well, that's actually Desire of Ages. I'm talking about of uh, Paul and Barnabas, and that'd be page 95, one sentence in there. It says, in the work of setting things in order in all the churches and ordaining suitable men to act as officers and apostles held to the highest standards of leadership outlined in the Old Testament scriptures. Well, what we find in the Old Testament scriptures, it said, appoint the sons of Aaron. And so she's saying that this was the order that they were to follow for the New Testament. It wasn't a new trajectory uh, for a new theology of ordination. Let, let's come back and talk about this. Uh, I noticed one of the questions on the survey, for instance, was about whether the world church should just let everybody do its own thing. In other words, let this division do its thing and another division as far as this issue is concerned. And wow, they turned that down pretty heavy duty. They, they did not uh, go there. What is the wisdom of that? What, what are they seeing that some folk are not seeing? What do you think? I don't, see, I don't think that they're seeing. <laughs> you know, 
Um, actually, in the Theology of Ordination Committee, there were three groups. Group number one uh, was composed of those who oppose uh, the ordination of women as pastors and elders. Group number two uh, believes that um, men and women are, are absolutely equal and have interchangeable roles. Group number three believes that uh, men do have spiritual leadership, but, you know, to not cause division in the church, uh, we need to allow each division and each union to make their own decision. However, group number three has made it clear that they will only do that if the general conference, the world church in general conference session votes in favor of it. So uh, I, I can't see the rationale of, uh, of doing something that is contrary to the Bible, which is going to eventually lead to congrega congregationalism. Well, the, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, it's your ministers, your ordained ministers, those that have the responsibility of overseeing the church. That's kind of in one sense, in one way, the glue that glues the world church together. Uh, because we have a unity of ordination all around the world. And uh, so the ordination that when you ordain someone in America, that ordination is good in Africa or it's good in Asia or wherever. And if we start dividing this up, then we're really asking for the church to be divided. And I think you're, it's a very good point. If we want to break up the church, then let's break up the ordination issue. And uh, so I, I think that folk in that survey are seeing the reality of that and the importance of staying together and staying together biblically on this. And while we may respect, uh, certainly respect people that have a difference of opinion, I, I tell you, the last thing I want to see is this church broken up. I want to see Jesus come, and God's got a lot of work for this church to do. Uh, so that third option is really no option at all. It's a bad option. It's a, yeah. yeah, the idea that, um, you know, while it is an imperfect world, that we would deliberately ever come together as a world church and say, we know this isn't what the Bible teaches, but in order for us to stay together, let's go ahead and compromise and vote it. That makes me shudder to think that we would knowingly choose to believe something that is unbiblical. Would the Adventist church have ever formed with that kind of mindset? And especially, Doug, when you take the example that they use to try and prove their point, that the, the, king of, king. the king of Israel. I mean, the argument is that God wanted to be Israel's king, but because the people wanted a human king, uh, God said, okay, I'll allow plan B, I'll allow less than the ideal. Supposedly to keep unity and to further the mission of Israel. Well, what happened? Israel was divided as a result of that into uh, 10 tribes and two tribes. And instead of them, um, you know, preserving the message and proclaiming the message, uh, their, their kings got married with uh, women from other nations and they lost their identity. So to use that example uh, to say that, you know, in organizational matters now, uh, you know, the church can deviate from God's ideal plan and adopt a plan B. At this stage in human history, when, when we're at the doors of the second coming of Christ, it just doesn't make any sense. And one other point on that is when they did end up picking a king, it says all of the elders came to Samuel. It is hardly all that are asking for this. It's, it's like there, there is, a, in my opinion, I think there's a minority a very bright and influential people that for whatever reason are pushing this. And it seems pretty evident. And, um, but the rank and file grassroots we, are actually we showing difference. We as a church different. and a people would, would lose the respect of those around. Many people say, well, I, I respect the Adventists, even though I don't agree with the Seventh-day Sabbath or whatever, but they're very consistent. They're Bible-believing people. If we accept this and we go into the accepting of homosexual marriages, then the, salad, the Sabbath has no validity. Uh, another, neither, I guess, any of our other foundational beliefs, doesn't it, Jay? It seems like there's an erosion about to take place, uh, and that's why we're having this program. I think this truth has to be safeguarded. And again, because what you're giving us is a picture of what can happen down the road. And we always need to look at consequences, but uh, it's really tonight and listening to you all that it's really clicking with me more than ever before, the importance of, of 
we really need to look at this as a church and a people and say, do we want to do this? Because as soon as we do this, we're throwing away a, a lot of the other pillars that we have stood on all these years. I, I don't know that I can say it better myself. Change your hermeneutics, change your religion. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, the, to me, the issue isn't really women's ordination. Mm -hmm. The real issue is the authority of Scripture within the church. Are we going to continue to be a Bible-believing, Bible-practicing church? That's, that's the real issue. I, I know that I understand the powers of culture. I understand, uh, you know, dreams and aspirations. But all of us have got to submit to Scripture. We've got to surrender my dreams and aspirations to the authority of Scripture. And uh, heaven is going to be a place made up of unselfish love. What a great place that's going to be. And this is a wonderful church. And if you, if you were the devil, you'd, do, you'd go after a couple of things. You'd go after the authority of Scripture within the church. As you can change that, you can fix, you can just about bring anything in. And you'd also go after the unity of the church. You want to break this church up. Uh, our, our, our Pope is the Heavenly Father, the real Papa. And, and Christ Jesus is our High Priest. And uh, the rest of us are submissive to their orders and to their directions. If Jesus, who thought it not um, wrong to be equal with God, if he can take on the role of a servant and be submissive to his heavenly Father in order to save us, then when he asks Jay Gallimore or any of us, whether we're male or female, whether we're children or whoever we are, to be submissive to God's divine order, why should we argue? Uh, we're headed to our heavenly culture where there's unselfish love and there's submissiveness in that culture. And because God said it that way before the fall when everything was perfect. So those are, those are the concerns that I see that uh, if you change the hermeneutics, you can open the door to anything, no matter how well-meaning people are. And I have friends and, that I love and admire. Uh, on both sides of this issue, but I cannot stand by and say we can just change the hermeneutics here and go down the road and, uh, and because it's going to open the door to stuff that we'll say, oh, what did we do? But then it's going to be too late to change that whole issue. To, to be a peculiar people, um, I have friends that's of other Christian persuasion, some Baptists, some Methodists, and some in particular, because of their political beliefs, I've noticed have been writing lately on media, social media, and they're Christians saying, you know what, we're in the, the 21st century, we have to put aside, anybody can marry anybody, you know, and we as Christians, it's wrong for us to judge others. The Bible says love one another, doesn't specifically say who. Now these are people that 10 years ago would have never, as much as we wouldn't have as a church, would have never gone that route to openly say this, he didn't say thus saith the, you know, they're not saying thus saith the word of God. They're looking at the climate around us and now it's more popular in many areas and we even have, an, and I don't want to get in political things, but when the President of the United States will call people publicly and they'll be on all the news to congratulate athletes or whomever because they're homosexual, I mean, something is wrong, and we all need to say, we better get back and look at the Bible and see what the Bible has to say, yeah. because so goes the leadership, so goes the people, and thus in our church, so goes the leadership, and many times, thus goes the people. So I appreciate you all standing up for what we believe is truth. Well, you know what, Danny, just to add to what you're saying, uh, five years ago, 60% uh, of the Americans were against same-sex marriage. In just five years, that has swapped to where now 60% uh, support same-sex marriage. You can see how public opinion can be changed. Right, wrong, truth, that doesn't come into uh, the, 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 the equation at all. Mm -hmm. It's simply public opinion, uh, what they will vote, what they are for. And uh, it has changed in just five years' time uh, from one extreme to another. You know, we've used the word culture a few times tonight, and it's sort of a nebulous term. But I think everybody knows that uh, media is extremely powerful, which is why we're here tonight. 
And there, there's someone else that has a number of stations, and he does not believe in Scripture, and the devil is using the media to program the young people into accepting values, and not just the, the homosexual issue, but on a whole spectrum of things, uh, values of violence and, uh, you know, values of immorality, um, so that if you stand up for biblical truth, you're going to be looked upon as an oddball in these days. And little by little, we need to worry about our young people and all the media because you can see those from the great generation, they're pretty straight on some of these things. But as time goes by, the younger ones are just being bombarded with programming that there's an attack really on men. You know, Ellen White says the greatest want in the world is the want of men. And some people will say, well, that just means people. But you read the context of what she said. She's talking about men. She talks about other men in Bible history. And the typical sitcom and the programs on television today and the commercials all make the father out to be the stooge of the family. And where God designed that men should be manly and, and brave and ready to lay down their lives for their families. Uh, the days of the Titanic where you said women and children first. You wonder what would happen today. You know, we should not allow political pressure to determine a decision. You know, what, what Jim was saying just a few moments ago, it rings so true. Let me give you an example. In 1996, pres then President Bill Clinton fought tooth and nail in favor of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, to get that through Congress. I mean, he was gung-ho. Now he's totally shifted because the times have shifted, and he says that this was one of the biggest mistakes of his presidency because of the pressure of culture. Times have changed, so the politicians say, I have to change too. The Seventh-day Adventist Church cannot make decisions based on that. The decisions that we make have to be based on this book right here. We yes. cannot allow political pressures or peer pressure or any other kind of pressure to determine what we do. It must come from sola scriptura. Yeah, let me, and let me uh, just zero in on that a moment. Because I was in one setting where uh, to support this change of ordaining opposite of Scripture, um, they said, well, you know, we've had dreams, and they, and they tell, but listen, dreams, we can go back in history and find people who had dreams about Sunday keeping. Dreams and visions still have to be measured by the Word of God. And, and they also tell these heart-wrenching stories. If you look at this whole homosexual thing that's done by telling all these stories, you know, and tear-jerking stories. Well, I, I like good stories too, but every story has got to be measured by the Word of God. And, and on this kind of thing, it's not emotion that's got to drive us. We've got to say, what says the Lord? I love what she says about in Great Controversy, and that's why I'm optimistic about God's church. She says, uh, and I'm, I'm not quoting it verbatim, but she says in so many words that God will have a people in the end of time that will demand a plain, thus says the Lord, no matter what the councils or whatever are learned men, and she, she goes on with that. Why does she say that? Because when Jesus comes again, he asks the question, will I find faith on earth? Well, faith is going to be faith in Christ and in the Scripture. And uh, so the issue that uh, I think our listeners have to ask themselves is not whether I'm for it or against it, but we would beg people, go to your Bible. Look at your Bible. Read your Bible on this. Look at it yourself and see what it says. Because at the end of the day, we've got to be faithful to the Word of God. We just have to be. We only have about five minutes left, so we'd like each of you to take a couple minutes. You're talking to uh, viewers around the world and, and maybe give us some, some insight, uh, some of your thoughts. Well, shall I start? <laughs> well, like Martin Luther said, here I stand, so help me God. And he stood on Scripture. Now we know that he didn't stand on Scripture and everything because he didn't keep the Sabbath, he didn't understand the state of the dead, but what made Luther's work so effective was sola scriptura. Everything had to be based on Scripture. And so whatever decision that we make as a church has to be based not on a change of hermeneutics, not on the basis of culture, purely and simply 
upon a simple reading of God's Word as the ultimate authority. Doug? You know, I, I'm very passionate about this also because as an evangelist for years, my, you know, this church I love and my, my passion and all that Amazing Facts does is to bring people into Christ, into His church. And when I see the new, we're using the word her hermeneutic, but the new Bible study principles being used to support um, women's ordination, I realize I could not preach our message using those same principles. And most of the evangelists I know feel the same way, that this is really going to affect the proclamation of the gospel if we, if we uh, get this wrong. And so, you know, I, I long to see not only our church stay together, I want it to stay together on the Word, and I want to see a revival. Even those who might have this issue right can still be lost. So we need a real revival of the Spirit, and maybe this issue will be the catalyst to get us back in our Bibles. Well, it's uh, any time that you have a difference of opinion with people, and uh, maybe even strong differences of opinion, we still have to maintain the love of God. Um, and, and we must love one another. What, the last thing we would want to do is to set up people uh, fighting with one another. But what we would like to do is say, go to the Bible together. Open it on your knees. Say, Lord Jesus, teach us what this says. And let's look in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Let's examine these things that have been brought forward. So that's what we would like to do, that people, people get together, open your Bible with an honest heart and say, Lord Jesus, and then let you, this is a representative form of church government. You should let people know how you feel. Your elected officials, uh, you should let them know how you feel and don't be afraid. Don't be silent. This is not the time to be silent. You know, if you'd like a copy of uh, this program tonight, you can call our office. We are closed now, but during work week starting Monday morning, uh, 8 to 5, call the office and um, if you can make a contribution, please do, but if you can't, we'll still send you a copy. Well, Danny, I'm really uh, happy that we had this discussion tonight. Well, I am too. I was sitting here thinking it's been almost this November, is 30 years since I'm a carpenter and a layman, but I had this impression to build a television station that will reach the world with an undiluted Three Angels messages, one that would counteract the counterfeit. At that time, I didn't even know, Brother Jay, what that meant, undiluted three angels' messages. Com confession's good for the soul, yet hard on the reputation. I grew up as a young person, kind of a legalistic Adventist home, so I could argue about the Sabbath with friends at school and the state of the dead and some of these things. But when I was impressed with that, I said, I should really get a better understanding before I go trying to raise a network to reach the world with an undiluted three angels' messages. I better find out what that really is. So it's interesting tonight, I'm still learning, but this is a fulfillment of almost 30 years ago. What I see tonight, undiluted truths coming from leadership representing the Seventh-day Adventist Church and, of course, us as laymen also joining hands together to be able to get a truth that's very important because we have seen 10 years ago no one, and Jim said maybe five years ago, we wouldn't have thought about this conversation no. tonight taking two hours to do this. Think what the future holds if we keep on this roll heading, and it's not good. So thank you for reminding us we have to come back to the Word of God, come back and say, Lord, we're your servants. We only want to do and only want to disseminate the gospel that you have given us. Help us to keep it pure, undiluted. You know, this nightlight program it was designed to talk about subjects that sometimes might not be talked about on many programs. We look at controversy. We look at things that uh, people are asking. And uh, uh, sometimes we get a little criticism for looking at, at some of these subjects that are really kind of touchy in, in many ways. But we thank you for understanding. We thank you for your prayers and financial support at 3ABN. Keep on keeping on with Jesus.